I used to doing that bit. <laughs> um, so yeah, welcome to this event. We wanted to hold an event talking about heat pumps. So sort of, I'm an architect, jack of all trades, master of known none. We know a little bit about a lot. Um, I just felt like there were lots of people who probably wanted to understand what the differences are between the different types of heat pumps. So ground, water, air. And I managed to convince, cajole these lovely people in from the university and Mar Johns um, and the manufacturers and engineering teams behind these installations to come and share some of their experiences. George, I like the way you sneak in there. No one notices. <laughs> no one notices. <laughs> and George from Kenta, the ground source heat pump manufacturer. So, do I? Yes, thanks, Sarah. Yeah, <laughs> traffic, that's all. So I think we've got a mixture of people here, you're all from different backgrounds, so I'm sure you've all got your different reasons for, for wanting to be here and understand about heat pumps. So hopefully our amazing panel of uh, experienced chaps will help to demystify, tell you some of the pros and cons, some of their experiences, benefits, problems, all sorts of things, the warts and all, just to help you maybe on your own journey towards making decisions to move towards heat pumps. In the future, um, things are changing rapidly, so keeping up speed with technology and what those options are is pretty essential. Uh, is someone else coming in? So, we're going to, oh, welcome from Sarah Lee, that's me first. Um, we're going to start talking about ground source heat pumps first. We've got John and Peter from Marjon and George, who's just arrived. We'll have a little bit of an opportunity for q a if anyone's got any immediate thoughts or questions they want to ask then then we'll move on to water source with brad from the university and russ from tark um and air source heat pumps as well with brad and then martin from sds so q a at the end and then james is going to have a little plug for his planet devices at the end so hopefully that will give you a good, <coughs> good chance to soak in some information and ask some questions so, hi, Lee. Without further ado, oh. <laughs> <laughs> <You're right. Thank laughs> you time that magnificently. Okay, uh, so which one, do, which one goes away? Right, right, right. right. Okay, smash on that. Swear, okay, any you. good? This one okay? Yeah. That one? Oh, Thanks very much. Stand over there. That one. Claire fact. and Amber are telling me the camera's yeah. up there. <laughs> this is a hybrid event, so we've got lots of people online as well. Yeah, thanks very much for inviting me. So my name is George Gillow. I work for Kenza. Uh, we are the UK's uh, largest installer and manufacturer of ground source heat pumps. Um, we're proudly Cornish um, and proudly West Country. Uh, we're a national company, but we are based in the Southwest. We've got um, uh, an office in Honiton as well as Bradford, and our factory is based in Cornwall. And we manufacture all our heat pumps from our factory. Mount Ellington Mine. Uh, we only do ground source heat pumps. Um, heat pumps obviously cause, come in different flavors, uh, air source and water source and ground source. Generally, the water source and ground source heat pumps are the same piece of kit, um, and this is how they work. Uh, very briefly, what a heat pump does, whether it's air source or ground source, it takes heat from a very large source in a low grade form. So whether that be the air, the ground, sea, water, lake, uh, wherever it comes from, it takes that heat energy in that low grade form into the heat pump. So we do it mostly by having 40 mil NDPE pipe. Now NDPE pipe is exactly the same material that you get your water supply to, to your house. So it's just that kind of plastic blue pipe. We tend to use a black pipe uh, which goes into the ground. Now that can go vertically straight down to anything up to 300 meters, or it can go horizontally around a back garden or in a field around about a meter under the ground. And that collects the heat energy. So that's kind of why we call it the collector. And that's really important when you're talking about heat networks and possibly district heating, that the network doesn't create heat. It just collects it for the heat pump. Okay, so you've got your pipes that go in the, into the ground. It's a flow and return system. It could be connected to a number of boreholes um, for a network heat pump solution. Sometimes we talk about fifth generation district heating, um, shared ground loops, shared ground arrays. But generally, it's the same thing. 
its pipes connected to one or a number of boreholes, possibly through a manifold, which is just a way of valving things on and off. So you've got the pipes that go into the ground, which collect the low grade heat energy. Um, now the heat pump itself, our heat pumps, um, they have a little circulator pump on the ground side. And so that pushes fluid around a closed system. We're only going to talk about the closed system in this instance, you can have open systems, but for the moment, we generally start off talking about closed loop systems. And that's because they're the lowest risk. Can be a little bit more expensive than other things, but uh, cost-wise, that kind of varies a bit. So just on the technology at the moment, we're talking about closed loop boreholes, okay? So the little circulator pump in the heat pump pushes the ground array fluid through the pipes, which then goes down to perhaps uh, 100, 150, or a number of them. So my house in Falmouth, uh, I've taken out the gas boiler and I've put in a ground source heat pump. It's 150 old, year old house. It's four bedrooms at end of terrace, time, small garden. And so I managed to fit in three uh, boreholes, 100 meters deep each. So the heat pump pushes the fluid around through one, two, three of them through a manifold. So it's goes equally through the uh, boreholes and then back into the house. Pushing it out of the heat pump, it's around about eight degrees and comes in five degrees higher, 12 and a half degrees. Now those sort of temperatures are typical for the Southwest. Uh, we've got undisturbed ground temperatures uh, around here of around about 10 to 12 degrees. Uh, I know a, a heat pump in Milo that's been there for over 20 years and the incoming temperature has never gone below 12 and a half degrees. We test the ground uh, in large uh, installations to make sure that uh, the ground temperature coming in is what we say it is, but generally it's around about 10 to 12 degrees. So coming into the heat pump, it takes five degrees of that heat energy and puts goes the rest of it. So that's why it goes back in at eight. So you can see on the left-hand side, it goes through a little box uh, that's a plate heat exchanger, which transfers the heat energy to that middle circuit. You can see you've got three distinctly separate circuits. Uh, they're all hydraulically separated, so the fluids don't mix, hence closed loop on the left-hand side. Um, so that five degrees is transferred to the refrigerant circuit. Now, this is the bit that's kind of like your fridge in your house. If you imagine your fridge, if it was made of rubber, you could turn the whole thing inside out. The grill at the back, which gets hot, that kind of represents the radiator in your house. Uh, and the food inside the fridge, which gets cold, that's where it takes the heat energy from, from the heat source. So in a similar way, the uh, refrigerant circuit, it takes that heat energy from the ground array, puts it in through the heat exchanger and into the refrigerant fluid. Now, when you put five degrees to a refrigerant fluid, it creates... Uh, or it increases the temperature enough so it boils. So once the refrigerant fluid has boiled and now it's into a gas, you can put it through the compressor. Now that's the bit that uses electricity. Uh, so the one kilowatt of electricity <coughs> takes the three kilowatts from the ground. And that's how you get your three to 400% efficiency. When you compress a gas, uh, if you imagine you put your thumb over your bicycle pump, and you give it a good pump, your thumb gets hot. It's exactly the same way. If you compress a gas, you increase the temperature. And that's what every heat pump does. Um, that hot energy, then that hot gas goes through to the next plate heat exchanger and transfers that heat energy to your heating system or your hot water system. Our heat pumps have two modes, uh, space heating or hot water. You can set your timer controllers in your house, whatever controller you want to have from the very basic uh, kind of positing controllers that we all used to have um, right up to today's smart meters. You can have any type of control you want. So generally you set your heat pump to create your hot water when electricity is cheap. Mine's set for in the middle of the night. However, I've got four teenage children, so the boost button gets pressed quite a lot. Uh, even with a 300 litre cylinder, you run out of hot water with that many baths and showers being run. It's still quicker than using an electric immersion heater because that heat pump will heat up within 10, 20 minutes. If you have a, a thermal store, it's even quicker. However, transferring the heat energy to the hot water or your space heating system. So the two modes that the heat pumps in, 
doesn't do both at once because it would be kind of over designing if you make your heat pump so it makes hot water at the same time as you're doing spade heating it wouldn't be really worth it so it would be then too expensive so for the hour or so it's on in the day at night time to create your hot water your heat pump makes uh heat heats the water up to around about 63 degrees my evo so it's stored at 60 degrees and for space heating if it's a new house it's around about 45 degrees flow for my house which is a, an old victorian it's a bit higher at 50 degrees flow and that, so it can cope with my radiators uh right so that's basically how it works we do a lot at the moment in Kenza for new build uh, developments my particular role is talking at the moment to all the uh, large house developers, so uh, Barrett, Persimmon, Vistry, that kind of top 15 volume house builders who were looking for a solution to overcome the future homes regulations and what are we going to do when we can't put a gas burner in? What are we going to do when we can't burn any fossil fuels? Well, you can put a heat pump in. And this is a development uh, down in Perrinporth. It's a model of it. It's a Reba Award winning development, uh, which was uh, 42 units, flats and houses. And they've all got a small heat pump in and a hot water cylinder in each apartment connected to a series of boreholes. Actually, these are on the edge of Perrinport Beach. How am I doing for time? Yeah, it's only quarter past. We're yeah. okay. Yeah. Okay, so really the important stuff. Um, why do we do what we do what we do? And why is it just ground source what we do? Well, the thing is, there's two main things that we believe in, and really why I'm in this industry. Um, is reducing the effects of climate change. Uh, how do we do that? Well, as I said, the heat pump is it's an electric piece of kit, like the fridge is. Uh, the heat pump is another electric piece of kit, which you wire up. Uh, that small one uh, that you saw in that flat, that's a six kilowatt. The even smaller one, which is for flats, is a 13 amp. So you could even put a three pin plug on the end of that and plug it in if you needed to. It uses the least amount of CO2 or produces the least amount of CO2 than any other system. That's because it's the most efficient. Okay, so on this chart, it kind of looks at uh, certain types of heating you could look at. Obviously, ground source and air source, they're both excellent pieces of kit, and that's what we're looking to really replace the whole of the gas industry uh, in the housing, certainly new build. And then in years to come, that will also replace a lot of the existing housing stocks heating systems. Um, I'm sure we'll hear later about air source heat pumps and how excellent they are as well. However, the reason I believe in ground source is it's slightly more efficient. Um, it, you know, we're now looking at efficiencies. This is kind of an old diagram. Now our newest heat pump that we launched last week, uh, the NX, it's actually 4.63035. So, sorry, I'm talking a bit of jargon there, but it's kind of 400% efficient. Your gas boiler in your house after it's been there for maybe 10 years, who's got a gas boiler at the moment? Yeah, who's got it that's perhaps more than eight years old? Well, you know, your efficiency's there, you're probably below 70%. So, you know, that takes us onto a cost issue, but also a 70% efficient system for the amount of heat energy your house is gonna need is producing quite a lot of CO2. So with a ground source heat pump at three to 400%, that doesn't drop off, even when it's 20, 25 years old, and that's our expected life of a ground source, it's still gonna be giving you those sort of efficiencies. So those are the efficiencies. Now electricity at the moment, it's a mix of renewables, and I think annually we're generally around about 40 to 50%, probably perhaps a little bit more, especially on days like today, uh, electricity produced by fossil fuels, so that's gas, uh, powered fire stations in, in the main. Um, and so that gives you uh, this amount of carbon dioxide created for every kilowatt hour um, that you use in your home. So your house will need a certain amount of kilowatt hours. If it's an old house uh, like mine, it's around about 10,000 kilowatt hours a year. Um, if it's a new home, it's 4,000 kilowatt hours, something like that. Pretty much in a new house, half space eating, half um hot water so that's the energy it uses uh and at these efficiencies then it get, leads to the amount of carbon intensity so the amount of carbon per kilowatt hour that you use and you can obviously see with those efficiencies the ground source heat pump produces the least amount of carbon dioxide 
uh, you know, compared to a gas boiler, uh, 450 uh, kilograms of CO2 uh, as compared to 2,471. So that's a year. So you can see there's a huge saving in carbon dioxide. And that's why the government are really pushing heat pumps as the replacement and not hydrogen for uh, gas boilers. That efficiency uh, also leads on to the second reason why we do this um, is because it saves you all money. Um, and, you know, thankfully for people like me, I've got a decent job, so I can pay my bills. But I used to work in the social housing industry, I used to be a development manager in Cornwall Council, and we were constantly looking for ways that people could actually heat their homes. Often we talk about fuel poverty and why we would do this and it would save people money. But in effect, it's not saving people money if they're not turning their heating on. It's just allowing them to live a life that is comfortable and perhaps would reduce the amount of excess debts that our country suffers every year. I mean, over the consistency, consistently over the last 10 years, it's around about 50,000 excess debts in our housing that could be, uh, um, uh, you know, could be fixed by having decent heating in, in people's homes, which they can afford to actually turn on. And that's the important thing. Um, so these kind of systems can help in, in those circumstances, uh, certainly in social housing um, and areas of poverty. Reducing fuel poverty and reducing the amount of CO2 that is produced in the atmosphere. The other good thing about uh, heat pumps on a general scale, so if you are a social housing, um, uh, housing association or a local authority, you can actually look at the whole system, um, passive, passive cooling, um, passive maintenance. That's the next thing we're doing is predict so you can uh, maintain your systems a lot better than they used to be. Uh, gas boilers needed a annual service check. Ours don't need a service check. They will run and run and run. They're a kind of fit and forget system. So it's a reduced maintenance, a longevity that's going to be there, um, and a reliance that you can uh, know that that heating is going to be on throughout the years um, and stopping the housing suffering from damp, mould, uh, which is one of the problems as well at the moment in social housing. <coughs> so, Kenza, uh, we've been around for 25 years now. Um, we have made uh, coming up to 16,000 heat pumps. I mean, that doesn't really sound a lot in the big scheme of things, the way we're going. Um, but very recently, Kenza have had some major investment from Legal in General, and that was 2020, just before the, uh, the lockdown, the first pandemic. And that allowed us to build uh, our brand new factory um, at Mount Wellington Mine. Um, and then last summer, we've had a £70 million investment from Octopus Energy. And this is really helping to uh, turbocharge the industry and, and what Kenza are trying to do. Um, we have, yeah, as I said, we've been producing around about, uh, gosh, we used to have weeks where we were, were producing eight heat pumps a day. And we'd be thinking, we're really doing something this week. Now we've got a factory that's going to be able to produce 30,000 heat pumps a year. And by the end of the decade, we'll be producing 70,000 heat pumps a year. And that's the kind of speed that we're looking to ramp up what we're doing. Um, and in a, you know, together with our other colleagues in the heat pump industry, we're looking to be able to provide all the new build housing um, and replace the amount of gas boilers that go in the housing. So I think it's around about 85% of all housing has gas boilers. That's going to be replaced by heat pumps. And from Kenza's point of view, we're hoping to be uh, the leading market share of ground source, um, which will we, we, we see will provide a, a, a very good alternative to the new built housing industry, to the gas boilers, and satisfy what they need to do from the future homes then. So we brought this one up, as uh, I'm sure our friends uh, from March are going to be explaining this a little bit further, but very proud uh, to have been involved with the uh, replacement heating system at March on University. Um, very interesting uh, project as well. Um, we put all the boreholes 
in the uh, playing field, um, 240 meters deep, I think they were, around about we've got uh, 150 kilowatts for the entire site, 84 boreholes with varying depths across the campus. Really interesting development because it was a mixture of uh, the academic blocks, so central plants, as well as individual heat pumps for the student blocks and the houses. So it really shows what Kenza is producing at the moment, right from the three, three kilowatt, right up to our commercial heat pumps, uh, which you can cascade together. That means you can join them up. So we make heat pumps from the three kilowatt, which is for flats uh, and very small houses, especially new builds with our new NX at five and the Evo range right through to an 80 kilowatt uh, heat pump. So at that point, I will pass okay. on to my colleagues at Marge. Thank you Thanks very much, George. Okay. 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 Afternoon, everybody. Um, yes, my name really is Peter Kay. Um, those of you hoping for some kind of comical interlude are going to be very disappointed um, and also if you're here to listen about technical bits about um, ground source heat pump you're also going to be disappointed um, John's my boss and he's now looking at me going what Peter talking about he's gone off message again um, okay. um, really this is a very kind of personal I suppose trip through ground source in the sense that it's only to do with what's happened at Marjon just to give you an idea of I think I what George said, actually, the scale of what can be done with ground source. Um, but just to sort of go back from, from a, again, a margin perspective, um, we put in place um, margin zero, so 2030 to try and get to, 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 to carbon zero by then. Um, we, we're concentrating on scope one and scope two because basically those are the ones we can control. Um, for those of you who don't, maybe know what, Scope one, two, and three are. This is a very brief overview of it all. One is <coughs> one that's you can read it there yourself. One is sort of direct stuff, two is where you get your electric from. Three is what your suppliers do. Um, and that's for obvious reasons a bit more difficult. Um, we can we, we we are starting to do that. We're starting to ask questions of our suppliers about it, things like that, but um it is a bit more difficult. Sort of our scope three is their scope one and two, I suppose, really is, is the way to look at it. Um so we've got a bit of a plan over the last few years. Um, first thing we did was a lot of PV panels that we got put in. Um, we got a lot of funding from Salex um, through their decarbonisation scheme, a um, million pounds or so to put in the, the PV, um, which has worked out really well. We got um, some figures through recently where we're using 97% of it on, on campus, um, which is really good. Um, Tied in with that, we got um, changed a lot of the, the lights to LEDs. It wasn't all of them, but we got quite a lot of it done, um, which has been really good. And then 2021, kind of come up to the summer, um, an application was put in um, for the ground source. Uh, we was a bit of backwards and forwards with, with Salex on that, but eventually kind of June time, we got um, a grant through. The only problem, which is where the problem started, was they needed it spent by March 2022. Um, so it was quite a tight timeline, um, as George's colleagues, if he ever, if he ever talks to them about it, will tell you. So there was a lot of planning done. I have to confess, I didn't join the university till November of 21, so John had all the hard, hard lifting to do. But you can imagine that that planning process was very compressed kind of over the summer. And it ended up with a lot of the work starting in September, just when the students were coming back. So there was a lot of having to work out what the campus was going to look like. And unlike for the other projects where it's a building, um, the project was campus wide. Um, if you can't see that, all those little blue circles are <coughs> where the four holes were. So George's talking about 84 being put, put down. That's our um, playing field in the bottom left hand corner. That's our campus. Uh, student village sort of the right hand side so there's a lot of disruption over the whole of the campus and um, there isn't really any other, any other way to do it um, you've got to drill bore holes and they're 150 200 meters deep and you've got a lot of them because it's a huge system um even for george's domestic system it was three bore holes in his back garden it, it's a lot of disruption 
and that's going vertically. Um, you know, for the horizontal, you've got to have a big garden that's still. Was it on granite? What if it's granite, really solid? Um, very quickly, granite's easier to drill in because the holes stay open, um, so it's not a problem drilling in granite. It's actually very good because you get really good thermal conductivity, so it's not as big. Mm -hmm. Good. Next That's really good. Technical stuff. <laughs> so the impact during construction was um, fairly substantial. Um, this, the bottom bit, so this bit here is what our pitches look like after the ball opened thin. <laughs> Um, so the horizontal lines are the, the linking of all the boreholes and the line, the sort of area along the top is, is where they all join together. Um, and that's the trench for the pipe coming up. So it went right through the middle of the campus um, to get to the North Platte room. Um, yeah, it was disruptive and it was difficult. Um, and hard work for myself and, and John and a, and a few others that were involved with it. Completed though. This is it. This is this is the student village after it's all done. This is all the boreholes in, and the grass has grown back, and you can't see anything. Um, you won't be able to see it. Well, certainly not anybody at the back. The little green boxes outside each of the houses is where the heat pumps are. Um, and George sort of touched on it again, but the heat pumps themselves, the footprint is about the size of a washing machine, and they're about half as high. That's it. That's all it is. The green boxes are just to keep them uh, waterproof. Um, the big system's slightly different. As you can tell from my accent, I'm not from here. The little bit of the world where I come from, I do like a good Titanic analogy. And this is like an engine room where these things are. Um, the the right-hand um, photograph are the enclosures for the buffer tanks. Because we were, we were having to generate so much heat for such a big set of buildings, um, we had to have two, two pairs of pumps um, one to boost it up to a certain temperature and then have to go round again on another set to boost it up again to, to literally generate enough hot water to go around the system. So it was a big undertaking for everybody. Um, and then in the south plant, um, we did have an existing plant room on the roof, um, but the kit was too big. So we, we ended up with a, a, a sort of shed outside, but it's it works quite well. It's just a single, a single but very big heat pump, um, which is, and they're working really well. So ultimately, it's given us 80% reduction in our carbon emissions. I have to confess that excludes the sports centre, um, which is still running a lot on gas. We've got big gym, big hall, swimming pool, which just eats energy. Mm -hmm. um, but the main campus, we've reduced it by 80%. Um, the difficulty we've got is this kind of 80-20 rule that the other 20% is going to take 80% of the effort. Um, but we've got, we've got some plans, and I'll come on to those in a second. Um, the monitoring side of it, which from a from our own perspective and also from Salex, they, they want to sort of see that we were, what the impact is, and this is where the sort of interesting bit comes. Um, we've got um, remote monitoring of all the systems. Um, every heat pump in the village, we've got a signal going to and from it. Um, we've got electricity <laughs> input, heat output, and also got a fault signal, which is great. It all shows green at the minute. I picked this on purpose. It's not always green. Um, sometimes it goes away. Um, so we've got a basic sort of system, then we've got a bit more we can sort of delve into the actual numbers of coming out of, of, of it, heat, heat out and electric in, so we can we can do all that. And if you're really nerdy like John, you've got graphs galore that stuff that can you know, spend hours on Excel and does stuff with it. But I like this one, this is the best one. Um, so we've got all the information, and, and it, it is one of those things, I think, with, with Kenza that we're going to look at over time. But this is the domestic one, but, but the bigger ones in particular um, are, are, are huge. Um, and it will be interesting to see um, that kind of energy side of it. We were talking about 300%, 304%, and also that useful energy versus the electric, you know, electric versus gas costs and things like that. So it'll be, it'll be good to see that. And then what next? Well, yeah, as I said, despite what I just said, that was actually the easy part. Um, we still have central heating boilers. We still have um, gas boilers. The sports center is probably the single biggest um, one that we have to sort out. Um, on that, we've kind of been looking at, can we extend PV generation um, or even the renewables? I've mentioned wind energy there at the, back, at the bottom. 
um, <laughs> the idea of being able to generate energy, store it, um, and those storage batteries need cooling down. Um, well, if we can take the heat out and heat the swimming pool, then we've kind of got a bit of a closed circuit. It's theoretically it can be done, but we haven't looked in detail at, at just what the practicalities are. Um, yeah, and it's it's quite expensive to do. Um, there's been some conversations recently about um, sort of data storage people needing um, heat sinks as well for and getting rid of that. So we're looking at maybe doing that as well, which is slightly off the ground source side of things. Um, Electric vehicles and EV charging points. We've got a couple of electric vehicles that we that our state's team use, and um, we've got EV charging points. We, we're in partnership with Plymouth City Council at the minute for one of their um, sort of northern Plymouth hubs for EV charging, which we're kind of working our way through at the minute, which is which is good. I mean, I, I think there are, there are, I think it's going to progress, and I think there will be more, not just um, for staff and student cars, but also for um, the kind of park and ride type thing that we, that we want to try and get involved with. Um, and that's it, really. So a very quick whiz through, and it was very much from a marginal perspective. It was very disruptive at the time, but it has settled down. And the, I have to say, my colleagues on the, the estates team have got very good at fixing the problems. Um, a bit like anything, it's you know, change from a gas boiler in your house to ground source heat pump kind of system. Kind of go watch all this it looks very different um and the guys have been very good and they've got very very good at being able to fix things the monitoring that we've got does help they can come in in the morning and look at that dashboard and if there are any red lights they can they can go out and fix it it doesn't tell us what the problem is but the fact that we know that there's a problem there they go out and fix it before the students get up so we've got till about 12 o'clock kids <laughs> <laughs> but no they, they they do and they've got a couple of guys in particular have got i've got very interested in it and um it, it's good to see um the bigger stuff we have to get somebody in because it's just it just it's very much the same technology but on a bigger scale and there's, there are there's a lot more involved with it um, so yeah that's a very brief whiz through Thank happy you. to take any questions yeah, which these two can answer because i yeah, yeah, <laughs> questions Questions directly about the Um, so uh, I was just wondering about the sorry, risk of a technical question. So that's sort of uh, the things that sort of spring to mind. You have this vast um, uh, array of boreholes. Are those uh, is that a, a closed loop array that you have there? It's the same as as correct me if I'm wrong, it's the same as what George was explaining on a domestic level, just on a big giant level, it's still closed. Yeah, is that poly pipe going down? Yeah. Or is it collapsible for anything? It, it's going straight down. It goes, yeah. it's, so it's two probes in a 150 mil diameter hole, which we drill directly down. Um, and then you have a, it's an electrofusion weld um, U bend joint to the bottom, so it creates a complete loop. Um, and then you feed that down, it's weighted, so it's dropped down, so you know exactly how deep it's going to be. The really important thing about how deep a borehole is, it, it depends how much heat a building needs. So this room will need, you know, sort of uh, one and a half kilowatts of heat to keep it to 21 degrees. And you will know it needs that much of kilowatt hours because the windows are double glazed, the walls got that much insulation. So it's a, it's what we call a room by room heat loss. Uh, it, it's quite important in when you're measuring up for um, buildings like Marjon and the university campus, these existing buildings retrofit, uh, you need to know exactly how much energy you're going to need to keep everybody warm to a 21 degrees, or if, say it's a care home, 23 degrees, whatever it needs to be. In fact, we've done Trillisic House in Cornwall, which actually wanted it at 16 because it was a great one listed um, in a national trust building. So you need, so you need to know exactly how much energy is going to be required uh, for that building to keep at that temperature. So then you look at how much heat you can take from the ground. And one of the questions you asked about the rock time, that's really important to understand uh, how much energy the, or how quickly that energy that the collectors are taking from the ground, how quickly that can be replaced. And that dictates how deep your borehole needs to be. So for example, if you're in a chalk area, um, in London, we do a lot of drilling. Um, the chalk 
in the ground, it replaces the heat energy slower than if you were in a granite area. And it's what we call a thermal conductivity. It's got a low thermal conductivity uh, in the southeast, Lincolnshire as well. Full of hot heat, a terrible place to drill. Um, however, we can do it, just your boreholes will be deeper. Um, where you've got good thermal conductivity, such as the granite places in Scotland or in Cornwall, St. Austell, Plymouth's very good at, at two. We've got a thermal conductivity, generally sandstone and mudstone uh, down here. Um, so, you, you know, it's still a reasonable place uh, to have your boreholes. So that calculation between what your geology, uh, the ground is made up of, down to around about 300 metres, and how much heat energy your building needs, a swimming pool is really difficult. I remember looking at Marjan at the very beginning, and a, a swimming pool, especially with all the bubbles, so if you put bubbles into a swimming pool, it loses so much energy. It's a nightmare to deal with. So the amount of energy your building needs, um, combined with the amount of energy that the ground can give, gives you the final result on how big your heat pumps need to be and how deep the boreholes need to be. Sorry, there was a question at the back first, so thanks, Eleni. Um, we have three money for today, and following from uh, George's comment on heat load, I'm just wondering if Marjan had to do some uh, insulation improvements, glazing improvements, or um, the little bit like the Yeah, no, 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 we, we did, um, particularly in the heart, in the, the village. We put insulation in the, in the village as best we could. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, it, it is. Like all heating systems, the more insulated the building, the easier it is and the, and the more efficient it is. We did what we could um, with the funding that we had. It would be nice to do more than uh, we just have done. It's probably worth adding, you need to put insulation in whatever your heating uh, system is. Often with the government grants uh, and through uh, public sector decomposition and SOLEX and the renewable heat incentive before that, you had to add, oh, I think there's another one around at the moment, you have to do the insulation first. Which is completely reasonable because you don't want to be using renewable energy to heat farm barns, which was the big scandal, wasn't it, many years ago. So, you know, it was quite reasonable to have that kind of addition. So you should do that whatever your, your heating system is in your house or your building. So, uh, but it isn't a necessity for renewables, for heat pumps. Uh, so, as I say, you know, we've done National Trust, leaky buildings, grade one listed. Um, well, you do what you can, but you can't go replacing the Victorian uh, single glazed windows. Uh, they're just conservation work, that is not my choice. Not yet. Yeah. Mm. It's got to be coming. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. Sorry, what's the question? Well, um, if you saw a difference on the Durrani cost, um, and the last one is if you were willing to share the appro approximate cost of the project as well. What was the second question? Sorry, is that you see a saving on running costs. We're, we're, we're gathering a lot of data at the minute, and I, I think one thing we have learned, and I think Kenza have as well, certainly on the commercial installation side, the bigger side of it, is having your data set pre and making sure you've got really clean single source truth data. Looking at that data as you go along, but then certainly looking at it post and doing the comparisons. Um, and I think with the as Peter said, the, the planning was hard graft, um, but we, having got the grant, we then needed to spend that grant within a very finite window, and it did become very compressed. And I think we probably missed a little bit of that pre-project data gathering, and that's left us a little bit on the back end of the project course, thinking, okay, we, and we now need to do that and get that data properly. We're slightly more complex as well, because at the same time as doing that, almost, the solar panels have just been installed. We upgraded our main transformers and we changed out all the LEDs. So it was an awful big jigsaw that all combined and separating out all that data um, and giving a very true, accurate picture has proved a little difficult, hence the monitoring. And I think monitoring data, internet of things, smart, is absolutely key, um, particularly on the commercial side. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Third um, question. The last question the, was the, the cost. The capital cost, to actually mind. put it in, we got a grant of 3.5 million pounds from Salex. The total cost was just over four. Um, so big lump of money, but it's 
There's a lot of it. <laughs> well, but bearing in mind that was 45 house installations and the commercial installation. So it sounds an awful lot, but actually when you break it down per property or per square metre. And how much would you need again when it breaks down after 25 years? That'll be somebody else. Yeah, we won't be. I'll have a tie of one before that. I've got friends no, in I... the village yes. where, where there was yeah. a thing um, uh, for, for a private bungalow, and the cost was 27,000 in some old ancient couple. If they're not going to spend that, they're just going sideways to gas now. Well, maybe they've got to think about their grandchildren and the future generations to come a little bit as well, you know? So the thing is that the borehole will last for 100 years. It's plastic and EPE pipe. Uh, mm -hmm. There's no electric kit outside of the heat pump, so even with a margon, it's exactly the same as it would be for an individual house. Um, the, the box inside your house, the, the, the Kenta heat pumps, um, they'll be 20, 25 years lasting. So that's kind of three times a gas boiler. Um, you know, and you have to spend how much on a gas but boiler? A gas boiler is a fraction of the cost to the heat pump, isn't it? Um, so when you say a fraction, it's perhaps uh, half the cost. Really? I, I um, but you might have to buy three um, gas boilers to to every ground source heat pump. So that's and we, we're what we're trying to do. I mean, to be fair to you, yes, they are expensive. Yeah, you know, compared to on another. If you're only looking at price, it is very difficult. One of the things we're desperately trying to do is drive the cost down. Uh, and the future home standard is doing that. The new government regulations. The other thing the government could do is perhaps reduce the price of electricity, which is artificially high. Perhaps they could increase the price of gas, which is artificially low. Yeah. Um, so there's there's a lot of rebalance. And then all of a sudden you'd be thinking, oh, we're doing all right, because this is cheaper than how we used to run it. Mm -hmm. And actually their system's going to be there for the next 20 to 25 years. And they'll see the cost of oil, gas, petrol, everything. All fossil fuels will go up yeah. and the price of electricity will come down. So. Mm -hmm. It's got to be consumer driven. It's, it's, so uh, this is part of it, really, is, is, is letting everybody know, because we're, like, we're a tiny company, but we are the UK's biggest. We're like, five, 10 years ago, when we first were talking about margin, there was 10 of us in Kenza contracting. And I remember talking to Matt Trawella and uh, Matt Zeely, um, and we said, we've got six months to design this system and get a price in. And it was like, it's a huge thing we're, we're at the end of the summer, and we've got to install it by June. Or you know, get it on with it. And so, yes, uh, and we are growing, um, and you know, this, the the industry is growing massively, and we are learning all the time. And but, a company like Octopus is supporting that. <laughs> yes, if there aren't enough. There should be more in the energy field, shouldn't there? Well, uh, yeah, Octopus is very good. Uh, they they're not just cans of ground source heat pumps; it's air source heat pumps. There's many different things mm -hmm. they're looking at. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much, and thanks for all your lovely questions. It's great to see so much interest, and that's the whole point of you guys coming in this. Thank you. We're going to move on. We're going to let Brad. Okay. Thank you. Brad, get on with water and sort air source. Welcome everyone. Welcome to University of Plymouth. Um, I'm the head of building and engineering, and the interim head of sustainability here at the university. So I look after the state. I work with a great sustainability team, and kind of lead on our decarbonisation strategy, and really try to put that into practice. Uh, before I start, just want to say thank you to Martin um, from SDS, who's going to talk with me about air source heat pumps, um, and also Ross from TARC, who's going to talk about water source heat pumps uh, with me. Very kind of them to give us some of their time. Um, so first, I'm about water source heat pumps. Just a bit of an overview of um, what we're doing here at the university uh, and, a, and a case study. Um, I'm going to prompt some of the similar questions. I've given it honesty, I've given it warts and all, it is bigger picture, it isn't all about the money and there is quite a, um, there's a bit of discussion for us to, be, to, to, to have there I think because uh, it isn't like the good old days as I refer to it or we used to say we'll replace the lights because I'll get a nice payback on that within three years, you know, think things have changed. So just a bit of a summary about our decarbonisation strategy or should I say heat decarbonisation strategy because this is, this is purely about that. We do take a fabric first approach, we've got examples of that on campus and I'll talk about some of those. But for this part, it's really about the electrification of our state um, and uh, move to heat works and move to, move to heat pumps, as well as uh, large volume of renewables that we've already done and we're doing in particular solar, solar PV um, at the moment. Um, so this is a snapshot of, I'd say, work in progress, some already delivered of our heat pumps on campus. 
Um, I'm going to briefly touch on all of those, but it just kind of gives you a kind of um, a view of, the, of just our, our main campus and, and what, what we what we have here. So some of those are already delivered, some of those are in progress, and some of those are kind of Reba stage four now. Best yes, so it happens um, before we before we go into construction. Um, I should say while we're here, I think afterwards we're off to do a site tour. Yeah, if people if, would like to have a look. So Brad's, Brad's offered to walk around it to the first floor. So yeah, the example we're going to see in a minute of Nancy Aston, we're happy to take people to see the plant room and to see the to see the reservoir. Thanks. Heat pump overview. Well, George is such a good job. I might as well miss this slide because pretty much I'm saying what George said, and obviously he's completely right um, and great stuff. So yeah, I think pretty much that's a that's a carbon carbon copy with a, with a nice illustration. Um, this does do a bit more, particularly because it's talking about air, water, ground, and then waste, which I'll come to at the end uh, very briefly. But this is a refrigerant cycle we're talking about, and this is then how the heat is emitted into our buildings. And that's really important because this is what can drive a lot of your costs and, and influence the technology, heat pump technology that you're going to, going to choose. So on to water source heat pumps. Um, Effectively, there's, there's, there's two systems, and the most predominant is, is the closed loop. So, like we're going to see from our case study, fluid pumped around a submerged steel pipes um, with pond mats or similar that gather heat energy from the water. The fluids then circulate back, circulated back to the heat pump, and then it's amplified. So that compression cycle that we, that we were talking about. And then an open loop, which effectively extracts the water, takes it in, sucks it up to the plant room, and then uh, returns it um, cooler. And we do have an example of that, but it's part of a research project. So it was a very small project, um, part of Eurospike and Interreg um, uh, research uh, funding. Um, so it could be an option for Brixton going forward. The boilers aren't a time in their life where we quite need to replace them yet, and they're fairly new and they're as efficient, but, but they are gas. So we do have plans to do something at Brixton long term. But what we did find for that in particular, particularly in low temperatures, where something like an air source heat pump might not fare so well, Fair particularly well because you don't get such the, the heat change uh, in the water in the water mass. So I'm surely going to hand over to Ross, but I think there's just the headline for what we're about to lead into, really. So this is our Nancy Astor building. It's just over there by the reservoir. This is a this is a picture of it. It's the water source heat pump. That's the decarbonisation value. Um, the installation was three hundred thirty thousand um, pounds. And we've saved 3,000 set, or we think we saved. We, we've only just commissioned January, I think, late, late January. The of January yeah. um, so the proof will be in the pudding, but that's our estimations. And so far, it's looking really good, in fact, better than I think, than I think we thought. So fingers crossed, but that's, that's our estimates. I think over to you, Ross, if you There's only two slides. Sorry. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, hold yeah. That. Apologies for holding pieces of paper. I'm, uh, I'm not very good at keeping things up there. Um, so I'm Ross Norfield, um, I'm a contracts manager for a company called Tark Solutions and we are a local mechanical and electrical specialist based in the heart of Plymouth. Um, we were tasked with the design development and subsequent installation of the Nancy Astor heat pump project. Um, as a company we took a real interest in this um, from a very early stage. Um, it presented itself as a really rare opportunity to exploit the low grade energy stored um, in the um, Drake Reservoir, um, which in, a, a, in an urban location scenario, this is a, a really rare opportunity um, not to be come across very often. Um, we knew from the outset it wouldn't be without its challenges, um, but we were genuinely excited about being involved um, in this small part of Plymouth University's decarbonisation goals. Um, so as an overview, what are the key parts of our installation? Well, you can see on the screen here um, a basic representation of, of the system and what it entails. Um, the system is used exclusively to heat the hot water of the Nancy Astor building, um, which includes uh, gymnasium, offices and showering facilities. Um, as Brad's already said, the installation is a closed loop, so none of the reservoir water actually enters the, the system as directly. Um, so in the uh, reservoir itself we've got four heat collectors which are essentially um, 250 meter long uh, pipe coils connected to a common manifold um, and header uh, which is located just in the in the Ensley yard um, where, where all the loops join together. Um, the pipe works filled with um, biodegradable 
um, heat transfer fluid, uh, which provides both antifreeze protection uh, and also actually helps increase the rate of the energy transfer. Down in the um, Nancy Astor basement, we've got a single three phase 15 kilowatt um, heat pump manufactured by Kenta. This is actually an Evo 15 kilowatt three phase. Um, and that feeds um, two large 400 litre hot water buffer stores. Um, the, the buffer stores have a really um, high gain coil in them. Um, it's got a large surface area, about 3.3 meters squared. Um, and they are specifically designed for the heat pump application. The buffers then feed into two main storage cylinders where we have direct electric immersion um, elements which actually raise the final temperature um, to just over 60 degrees. Um, the system is controlled much like Marjons by the, the site-wide building management system, um, allowing it to be monitored and controlled remotely. Um, and this will obviously also give an insight to ongoing performance and give them the ability to gather um, ongoing energy usage data. Um, this slide here is actually a screenshot of what uh, the end user can see from the head-end computer, which gives you a good visual representation of the system. This is the pond, this is the heat pump, these are the buffer vessels, and then that moves on to the, the, the main chlorophyll or cylinders of the system. Um, so what were the challenges for us? Um, well, there were quite a few, unfortunately, um, with a project like this. Um, firstly, from a health and safety perspective, um, having to work alongside open water um, presented quite a few challenges of its own. Um, so we, we aim to set out to reduce risks as far as practical. Um, so having assessed the risk of physically having to go out into the reservoir, in a boat, um, we managed to actually eliminate that risk um, by devising a system of ropes and pulleys um, to actually position the heat collectors in, in the reservoir. So the pipe cores are buoyant, so they're filled with air, they're made of plastic, so they actually float. Um, so we, were, we actually managed to kind of float them out into position on the water. We then moored them, much like you would do with a boat, and then when we finally primed the pipework, they then easily sank into their final positions. Interestingly, the reservoir and its stone built structure actually holds a uh, listed status due to historical importance. Um, however, it was granted planning permission for the project by Plymouth City Council. Um, but the conditions of the planning did, however, prevent us from making any fixings into the reservoir wall itself. So kind of gave us another obstacle to overcome. So the pipework entering and exiting the reservoir um, had a requirement to be sleeved. So we had to put it in some stainless steel ducts and this was to help it blend in and be aesthetically similar to some of the things around the reservoir already. The ducts that we needed to use to house all of the pipework we had four coils, um, each with roughly uh, one inch diameter to pipe work going back. So we've got eight pipes coming back. We've got to then hide them on the way back out of the reservoir. So we, we ended up with two 250 mil stainless steel ducts um, that weighed about 150 kilograms each. And we can't drill into the side of the reservoir to support them. So what you can't see now that we're finished, actually below the surface of the soil on the bank, it's actually about two ton of concrete buried below the surface. And what that's doing is acting as a ballast and the pipe sleeves are cantilevers supported from, from the concrete base. Um, and this allows the pipes to suspend over the edge of the reservoir and drop down below the waterline. Um, actually physically doing that presented another problem because again, we can't secure into the wall. Um, so we had a bit of a conundrum with regards to scaffolding and access. Luckily, we were able to engage with a local specialist that did have experience with working near open water. Um, and they managed to provide us with a cantity with design, again, with some ballast weights on, on the ground side and actually managed to cradle us over the edge of the pond safely to actually carry out the work. <laughs> it was interesting, funny. it was interesting, yeah. Like Mission Impossible. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so to put these pipes in, 
Um, we needed to occupy some of the space around the reservoir. Uh, there's a lot of vegetation around there, so we actually mm -hmm. ended up having to have a ecological park of work to so oversee the project as well. They carried out regular checks for nesting birds and various other ecological assessments along the way while, while we progressed. <laughs> Now, probably the biggest design challenge for us was to ensure we met the university's um, water compliance code of conduct or practice for the stored hot water temperatures and distribution. Uh, this was challenging because the employer's requirements didn't lend themselves to the use of a high temperature heat pump, meaning at design stage we had to assume a worst case scenario of a 55 degree ach achievable temperature from the renewable source alone. Although um, higher seasonal temperatures were expected, we couldn't rely on this at that stage. So we explored several options with a view to operate the system at a lower temperature. Um, we looked at using chlorine dioxide, dosing, um, and an alternative silver copper ionization treatments. However, the capital cost was really high, maintenance costs were really high as well, and it was eventually concluded that we needed to boost the temperature using direct electrical input to take care of the final few degrees so we're getting about 55 degrees we need to store it at 60 65 so we've boosted up at the, the final stage using direct electric <coughs> that also allows us to carry out the weekly anti legionella function where we have to raise the temperature for a set period of time to ensure the water hygiene is retained um other than that other challenges were keeping the whole system operational. So it's obviously it's an existing building, it's used pretty much all the time as a gym, they use the showers. So we had to keep the existing system running the whole time we were kind of planning and bringing the new system online. Luckily we were able to do this by actually, it's a big plant room, we're really blessed with the amount of space in this plant, which is really unusual, but we were able to actually construct our plant in a different location to the existing gas appliances. So we managed to bring all of the new stuff online and then do a final changeover from the old system to the new with very, very little disruption. Um, so in summary, does it work? Well, yes, it does. And it's actually performing really well, as, as Brad has already suggested. And as I already said, we, we actually commissioned the system on the 18th of January this year, which ironically was the coldest day of the year. Um, it was minus four degrees that day. Uh, and the reservoir was actually completely iced over on the day of commissioning. However, by the end of the commissioning process on that same day, we were actually producing water output from the heat pump at around 60 degrees C, which truly exceeded our expectations. Um, personally, I really enjoyed this project uh, and the involvement and the shift towards um, low carbon technology. I hope you enjoyed this small insight into how we delivered the project and as Brad's already said, there will be an opportunity, an opportunity to have a quick look around at the end. Thank, Thank you. you. How can you get heat from freezing water? I didn't understand this. Well, although there's a layer of ice on the top of the water, the main body of water stays at a fairly constant temperature. So they're not hot. No, but I mean today it's 14 degrees in the lake, and, and on that coldest day, the lake was still around 10 degrees below the ice. So the ice only almost acts as a, as a blanket, in, in fact, so actually insulates the water below. Enough, enough, yeah. it's still enough heat to extract. The, 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 the actual but temperature... You, you heat it up then to 55 degrees from 10, 14. Yeah, so that's done through, through the heat pump itself in the same way that the ground source heat pumps work. Um, so just extracting that so below ground energy. an awful lot of extra heat in. So the water that goes back to the lake is cold, it's freezing, below freezing in fact, and then by the time we come back again, we've extracted that extra heat and we're coming back with, with more energy. You, you've got to remember, it doesn't heat it up, it squeezes the temperature. Compression. Compression. Ah, increasing the pressure. Ah, compression. Right. Thank you. Thanks, Ross. Thank you. So I think it's just a quick wash up from, from, from our perspective. So there's there's some pros there. We've seen a real good efficiency of, of, of the heat pump. Um, long lifespans, we've done some work on the maintenance and longevity of, uh, of that, and it's definitely comparable to boilers. In fact, most people suggest it's going to last longer. Um, no large scale ground works, but then we hear from Ross how difficult it was to put them in place. There's, there's, there's a bit of a, a give and take there. 
Um, it, is, it, is, it is harder to install an air source heat pump. And I think a couple of the main lessons learned from us, we struggled to deliver this and we did go to the market. We couldn't get anyone, no one really wants to engage in it because of the risks. Mm -hmm. If it wasn't for TARC, to be honest, we probably wouldn't have done it because just no one really wanted to touch with the bar gold because it sounded too weird, too risky, <laughs> too whatever. So um, we've done a lot of work with TARC, but you know, it's a good, good job there, interesting. They, did, they didn't just turn up and install it, they were contributing to the design as well. So um, yeah, they really did help us, help us deliver it. Um, so yeah. Fully consider your temperatures, we discussed the water hygiene, um, obviously making sure that we clear off any risk of Legionella bacteria by getting up to six degrees stored, 50 degrees distribution. Partner planning, consistency and liability. So I think we see in, in Kenza, in SDS, and in, in Antarctica, the reason that these kind of projects are the success is look at what, look at what we've got our, uh, at our back door of, of these specialists who can deliver these type of projects um, for us. <laughs> So I think I'm going to move straight into air source heat yes, pumps. Yes, that... that's right. Unless anyone's got any other quick questions about ground. About water. Um, is that's there a water. discernible all-in temperature, average temperature of the whole reservoir from this? Or um, is it no, and so, or? no. So and so as part of the planning, we mm. had to do a lot of studies yeah. and a kind of environmental management plan. I mm. think is the is mm. the is the full piece of work we we had to do to mm. to to prove that. So mm. no, really, there's no impact on the or a large impact on the body of water and means right. nothing for the biodiversity. Mm. Yes. Yeah, there's one there from online, which is uh, from the work of Mark Summer, and um, it said, can you use rivers or underground streams as the heat source with uh, open systems instead of closed systems? Uh, yes, you can. Uh, I've got no experience of that. Yeah. And I don't have any rivers right there. There we go. Yeah, we've got many um, heat pumps in the Thames, in fact. Um, so yeah, river water. The problem with river water, though, it's generally colder. Sea water is warmer, so you get less efficiency out of the river waters. The, the efficiency comes from the difference between the temperature coming into the heat pump and what you need it going out. And so uh, the closer the temperature can be, the more efficient it is and the less you pay for your electricity. I was just going to add to that main thing with open source is the environmental aspects. So you need a consent to discharge the water back in at the right conditions. So it can be a little bit more complicated from a compliance perspective. How common are these now? How, how many water source heat pumps are you seeing around the country? You know? Less common than the closed loop borehole, but um, for one-off properties, it can be a really good solution. So, uh, because obviously you're not drilling, you've got the expense of installing the boreholes, you can use energy blades, you can use pond mats. So they can still be closed loop, but using the water energy. It's often designing, through what's available in your local environment. Yeah. Interesting. I think we'll move on to air source heat pumps. Right, so straight to air source heat pumps. Um, tag team with Martin Jackson from SDS um, for this. So thanks again, uh, Martin. Got loads of slides, so I am going to rush through some of this to make sure that we've got a good time and can take questions after, but I've just tried to pack it full of every kind of fact, figure, all the case studies, all the case studies that we, we've got. So just the, the Babbage building, so our, our new engineering and, and our facility, lovely building, it, it, it's great. So that is net reverse air source heat pump, so that does our heating and does our cooling. Um, via radiator and underfloor heating, um, it's got connection there, kind of sitting and waiting for any future district heat network connection. We didn't knock the building down to start again, we retained the fabric, so we made thousands of tons of saline in those that embodied carbon. We put as much solar as we could possibly get on the roof, and it's 40, 49,000 kilo, kilo hours um, per year. And decarbonisation by comparison to the old building, at least 130 tonnes of, of CO2 saved just on the heating element of that compared to what we're benchmarking against what we had what we had previously. Portland Square, so that the one we just discussed is delivering and doing. This one is being built as we speak, just over here um, by, by Mary Newman. We've got Salix funding for it, which is great, and it really has been an enabler, and we've talked about it here, that is enabling a lot of our projects to happen. Um, so that, again, is a heat pump. It's a high-temperature heat pump. It has got a, uh, a boiler, an uh, electric boiler with it as well, just through that final top-up for the coldest days. Um, we kind of took a principle of no gas. So people are using hybrids. But that was a conscious decision to use an electric boiler just to, to, just to top that up. The fabric, um, there's a lot of glass. We're not replacing the glazing. I can discuss some more examples of, of that later. Cost, it's 1.6 million pounds um, to put in this new, new heating system. 
estimates might save us three thousand pound a year. So in old money, when you're trying to look at paybacks, which I'm not saying is the thing to do, mm -hmm. but a lot of people do kind of engage in, oh, what does that look like as a payback? Then you, you need to think bigger picture. And, and as a university, we're thinking there's a, there's a bigger picture. It's about the, it's about decarbonisation. Um, so there's some of the figures. And we've also get heat recovery from our data centre. So our data centre is important. Square, our biggest data centre. We're going to take the heat recovery of that contribute back to the system as well. So that saving of 3,000 isn't accounting for what we're going to get from the data centre as well. Fitzroy building, literally just out just out here, it's in a real good position now. You see you see the work they're doing on the fabric, you see the existing building fabric, you see the insulation that we're now putting on top of that. The cladding is then going to go over that. So that is an air source heat pump um, as, as well. Um, the fabric saving from the cladding insulation, uh, 369. Tons of tons of CO2, um, solar on the roof as well. The cost. This is just an estimate because it's only it's part of the big part of the big project. But my estimate is probably about five million pounds because we're ripping the building out and starting again. And the decarbonisation of the heating element, thirty-five tons of, of CO2. Right. So really rattle through that. A few more examples as well and, and stuff to come. But I'm going to hand over to Martin to talk us about designing for SLC pumps. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Or... I hope you could yeah. do I'll just the. Hello everyone, I'm Martin. I work for Services Design Solution. We're a building services consultancy, so we're involved in design. Um, so this, to be honest, is, is quite focused on design. As you can see, um, maybe people have seen this model before, but it's just trying to explain the principles um, for getting to not just a low carbon, but hopefully net zero carbon, if not now, but certainly in the future. So the main principle at the beginning is be lean. So what do we mean by that? Drive down the energy of a building from the very beginning by looking at a fabric first approach. So making sure that you're building the thermal en envelope is performing as, as much as possible. People may have heard of the passive house um, design. That's like the gold standard, but you can certainly get close to that for not spending as much money. And that will certainly help with the energy for the building. The next key thing is uh, glazing size. Um, glazing, it doesn't perform anywhere near as good as a wall, which people often forget. and people like to put in glazing so they can see out, but actually it can perform 10 times worse than a thermal envelope. So just bear that in mind. Um, the other thing is solar shading and it's kind of linked with passive design. It's trying to reduce the energy by not creating a situation where it's overheating or you need mechanical cooling. So if you can use uh, features like solar glazing or making sure that windows are smaller on certain elevations, that have high uh, solar gains. Also, adding thermal mass, if it's a new building, can you put thermal mass into a building which will absorb heat throughout the day and reduce cooling loads? So that's it in a, a snapshot, but just wanted to check here. So building regs is what I would say baseline, because that's telling you this is the minimum standard you need to do, okay? So as designers, we'll use this principle to say, let's not just hit building regs, let's push beyond that. So that's the be lean process, working with architects to, to design the building in that way. The next step is kind of what we do, which is looking at the services inside the building. So be clean, make sure that you're using energy efficiently and not wasting it. Um, so system choice is very important in that. And that's essentially, you know, heat pumps or your heating system. What emitters are you going to use? Are they going to have fans in them which consume energy as well? Or are they going to be radiators, which are obviously a bit more energy saving? Um, the next one is operating temperatures. So you probably heard everyone saying the same message, but heat pumps really like low temperatures. Uh, what compromises that is domestic hot water. So Ross was talking about that before. As soon as you get into storing hot water, you have to maintain a certain temperature, which is 60 plus degrees in the cylinder. And heat pumps don't particularly like that temperature. You can get high temperature heat pumps, but the coefficient of performance
performances around potentially 200%. So it really limits the, the options there. The other thing is standing losses. So we've talked about heat networks and basically the whole message with a heat network is make sure that your return temperatures are low. So if you're distributing water-based systems, you wanna make sure that you're reducing the loss through that piping system. Um, so that's one way to drive down energy. And we've already talked about the emitter choice. The next one is B green. So that's why we're here. <laughs> But our focus today is on, uh, well, this section is air source heat pumps, but you can use other heat pumps uh, that have been talked about. So once you've done all that, this really can get to a low carbon design is what I would call it. Next stage is what can we do to get to net zero? And potentially we can use other supplementary technologies like photovoltaics and even wind if the site is going to help with that. So over the top, you might see here is BC, and it was talked about by Marjons as well, that throughout this process, we really want to monitor, verify, and report, and report that out online through a portal that's accessible um, by lots of people. And, and that's it really. I mean, the main challenge with net zero carbon is it's, it's linked to a, a wider strategy for um, decarbonizing the national grid. So a lot of this is to do with projecting in the future, once that has become a lot greener, then we can support the, the strategy by using electric driven heat sources like heat pumps. Um, the other side of it is that the infrastructure of the national grid, it needs to be upgraded to support all of this electrification of heat vehicle charging points. So. If you can use a heat pump, which takes one unit of electricity and then takes free energy from the ground, water or air, it certainly upscales that and it helps with not overburdening the, the national grid. So, so moving on to this, it's a bit wordy, so I'm not going to dwell on all of these points, but really it starts with the feasibility. Can we use air source heat pumps? Lots of things feed into this, like the planning policies. Um, another important thing is we've, we've seen is, is net zero carbon. There's a lots of uh, climate change uh, emergency guides which have come out. So I'll just touch on Letty and Reba 2030 for anyone who's interested and hasn't heard of that. You can find that online. Um, moving on to sort of the design aspects now, energy centers. Um, is it just a single building? Is it existing buildings that you could potentially feed <coughs> other buildings? Is it master planning in terms of a, a new build town or a campus where there's lots of buildings? So really, if you got the opportunity, look ahead, what can we do to support other buildings that might be happening around? So the next thing is technology appraisals. You can really group air source into three families, I would say. Air to air. So that's your typical air conditioners where you've got an outdoor unit and an indoor unit, and you actually connect them with refrigerant piping. Uh, it's been around for a long time, that technology, like 1850s. So people might look at heat pumps and say, you know, we've used gas boilers for for ages and this looks like a new technology but it's actually been around for quite quite a long time um, the other modes we've talked about reversible which is great but you can't have heating and cooling at the same time it's a it's an either or next one which is really dependent on whether you've got a balance of needing heating and cooling at the same time you can put in a simultaneous or heat recovery um, air source we won't go into too much detail because this is a lot of refrigerant numbers, but there are natural refrigerants that are coming out. Um, they've been around for, for, for a little while. Um, some of them are CO2. Um, sounds strange, but actually you can use it as a refrigerant and it's got a global warming potential of one. So it's, it's very good in terms of the environment, although I'm trying to save CO2 seems strange that we want to put it into a heat pump and use it as a refrigerant, but actually it's because of the charge and it's a very minimal 
the volume. So at the end of life, when you release that, it's really not that bad for the environment. The next one is propane. Again, this seems strange because it's a fossil fuel, but it's a similar process. We're not burning it. We're just using it as a refrigerant. And the volume is very low. So when you release it to atmosphere at the end of life, it's, it's not going to be um, as bad as some of the other refrigerants that you might see. Um, noise is kind of self-explanatory. It's an outdoor unit. It does generate noise, but that can be designed um, to minimize uh, noise pollution. Spatial planning. This is a, an important consideration um, with most heat pumps, but particularly air source. Uh, they have a footprint, they need to go outside, and they can be a lot larger than boilers, um, and, and that's the main issue. They need an indoor plant space as well, because you've got all of the equipment that needs to support that heat pump. And just a quick one, I've put, uh, don't obstruct the air paths. They need to be in a space where they're not um, obstructed by walls, fences, all that type of thing. Uh, just so that they can take the heat from the air effectively, or you'll just create a, a little heat island, if you will. Um, systems. So this is kind of linked to the other modes of operation, but you can have uh, heating and cooling, heating only, and you can have hot water. Uh, the important decision, I suppose, from a des design perspective is do you want to have a water-based distribution system or a refrigerant-based distribution system? And really what informs that is efficiency. It's more efficient with refrigerant distribution, but you need AC uh, specialist installers and maintainers. Whereas with a water-based system, it's for plumbers and it's, it's less specialist. So that's something to consider. And environment we've talked about um it's a coastal environment so if you don't have special treatments on your heat exchanger it will corrode in this type of aggressive environment but it's nothing unusual they provide that kind of treatment on the <coughs> air source heat pumps um, and then the other one is performance so it's a little bit hard sometimes to compare different heat pump performances and a lot of manufacturers will quote air source heat pump figures at a air temperature of 7 and a leaving water of 35. Uh, leaving water of 35 on a water-based heating system is exceptionally low, so it's not always realistic. And a 7 degree outside air temperature is not always as, as um, accurate as it could be either. So it's a note really that you need to check the actual performance at the operating conditions. Okay, so moving on. So we've chosen uh, one of the case studies to be Intercity Place. Um, hopefully people are familiar with the building, but it's a 10 story uh, building just by the railway station in Plymouth. And you can see it's just the 3D model of the building compared to, to this building. It was a previous, um, it had previous ownership and then the university took it on as an asset, so they wanted to refurbish it to suit the, the new usage. So what was that new usage? It was an office admin education, which you would be surprised, and it's an asset of the university, but it was for healthcare professionals. Um, constraints. So this is kind of what led it towards an air source heat pump, because it was in a city. We didn't have water available to use a water source. Yeah. And although Plymouth City Council have plans for an ambient loop network uh, where we could have taken the heat from an ambient loop, therefore water source would have been okay. It, we just don't have that available at the moment. And the other thing that's important, it's near a railway, so we couldn't really um, drill close to a railway because they wouldn't like that vibration. Um, the other thing was cost. So as SDS, we, we were eventually involved in the design, but we didn't start the process. So we inherited a scheme proposal and there were some budget issues. So we were tasked with trying to bring that cost down and what would be the most effective way to do that. So specific considerations. Um, 
we've we've seen it before and we've talked about it a lot but really attack can we upgrade the building fabric can we replace the windows all that good stuff um i think what i'll do is skip over this because we kind of address it in the in the next slide so so how did we do that we upgraded the facade as you can imagine and we replaced the windows and what we did is we thermally modeled the building using computer software to understand if there was an overheating risk and we identified that if we had solar control glazing and we put a g a g value of 0.33 that would really control overheating and reduce any cooling loads on the building. Um, the next thing that we did was we really wanted to uh, complement the, the university strategy um, to reduce cooling. So one way to do that was to use a mechanical ventilation system and that would make use of outside air if we could use that to cool the building. Um, and that provides an opportunity for nighttime cooling as well, which is typically colder overnight. And we had heat recovery, so we could actually recover the heat from the air <coughs> using the room air. So that would reduce the heat load on the building as well, and cooling loads. As I said, modeling helped with that. What was the solution? So this is um, kind of a different solution, but it's actually quite common and used all over the world and is, is really well established in the UK. And it is an air to air system. So I've used BRV, that stands for variable refrigerant volume. Dakin invented it and all the other manufacturers don't call it BRV, they call it VRF, which <laughs> is variable refrigerant flow. So I just wanted to clarify that for those people who, who would question VRV. Um, we have five systems, so it was a 10 storey building. We split it two floors per system, and that was really just to reduce the size of the plant and the amount of refrigerant that would, could be discharged into a single room if it was all connected to a single system. Um, why did we do that? Well, we did it because actually it's a very efficient technology um, and it has variable uh, drive inverters so they can match low loads not just the high loads it's also um, got the opportunity for heat recovery it's a three pipe system so what they use is a high pressure gas which provides heating and it also has a high pressure liquid which can then provide cooling and then the third pipe is a low pressure gas which goes back to the outdoor unit so Another sort of confusion is that often you might hear outdoor units referred to as condensers. That's if it's in cooling mode, whereas with a heat pump, the condenser goes either in the outdoor unit or it goes in the building. So in this case, if it was in heating mode, the internal unit is a condenser, but in cooling mode, it becomes an evaporator, which is quite interesting. Um, this kind of thing is, is kind of limited to the emitter choice. You, you can only use uh, fan coils unless you use a hydro box, which then allows you to switch to water. But typically you'd only do that if it was for like hot water production or maybe an underfloor heating circuit or something like that. So what we used was fan coil units, um, which pull air from the room and then they heat it or cool it and put it back into the room. Uh, another important feature is the branch selector boxes. So this essentially switches between the high pressure gas and high pressure liquid. So you can have heating or cooling in a room. So that's all that that does. And it's heat recovery because say you have a room that's in heating, it's providing that heat energy, um, but you're taking heat out of something and that then goes into the room requiring cooling and vice versa. So it's, it's quite interesting. Okay. So this is, it's, it's quite challenging actually to, to provide a benchmark. So what we've used is the energy performance certificate. So this is actually the performance of the building at the, at the moment, it achieved a B. And you can see here that based on other buildings of a similar type, if it was newly built, it would be a B 
So that was quite a good achievement that we've managed to achieve the same ish as a new build. If it was an existing building, which it was, unfortunately, we don't have that data because it wasn't a university asset. Um, but essentially, this is saying that it would have been a D. So it's improved from a D to a B, which we think is, is really good. Um, I've put some notes here, which is essentially saying for net zero carbon, uh, we want to look at the operation of the building. So what this does is it looks at regulated um, energy only, which is from fixed building services. So lighting, heating, hot water. What it doesn't include is anything that you, you plug in. So IT equipment or appliances. So it, it's a snapshot, it's not the full story. But what we're saying is you can do that. You can do operational energy modeling and that's kind of the, the roadmap to net zero is to use that type of modeling to really understand how um, we can drive down towards net zero. And that's it. Yeah. Yeah. How are we going for time? Yeah, it's just half past, so we've got half an hour left. Yeah, well, we'll tell you that long. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> so in a nutshell, this is this is similar similar to the others. This is this is the summary of, of, of Intercity Place. So air source heat pump that we discussed. Again, we didn't knock the building down, so we've we have we have got the, the, the benefit of the embodied carbon, new cladding, new insulation, new windows, um, the lot, as much so as we can get on the roof. And yeah, like we said, I don't have the decarbonisation stats because it wasn't our asset beforehand and we don't know what it was using, but we moved it from a, from a D to a D. So I'm just going to try and bring everything together as, as, as best I can. Um, one thing I did want to compare, so this is a feasibility study that I'm currently doing at the work for Scott Building. So I just want to reflect on some of the, so or on Martin, kind of being pigeonholed there because I've asked him to help me with air source heat, heat pumps and present on that. but. When we start, it isn't how do we design for an air source heat pump? It's what's the right solution. So we've not ruled anything out at that stage. It could be air, it could be water, it could be it could be ground. Um, so this is this is some options, and this was leading leading us to to an air. But um, yeah, it looks like it's going to be an air source heat pump. This is, is the right solution for that building. Lower emissions, obviously, with a lower temperature solution, lower running costs, ninety percent um, more carbon saved if you go to a lower temperature system. But a lower temperature system, primarily because you need to change the emitters, so it might need bigger radiators or fan coil units. You know, you've got less less hot emitters in it in effect, so they need to they need to be bigger and to get that heat out. So it could cost thirty two more thirty two percent more to install in this instance. Um, but if we go the low temperature, we're getting thirty three percent reduction in, in running costs. So there's a there's a bit of give and take there. And if we went for the out and out high temperature heat pump actually it's going to cost us more um, to run and that, that could change because what's going to happen with electricity prices in two months two years so what that, 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 that can completely change almost at the, at the flip of the coin so i just wanted to try and summarize and maybe bust some myths or give my opinion on some of the bigger questions so heat pumps won't last as long as boilers i've spoken to lots of people but i've spoken to dark i've spoken to uh, our maintainers i've looked at the city guide so on and so forth i think in summary they're very similar. You know, you're not going to you're not going to see a lot of difference. Um, Simply saying, 50 to 20 years for a gas boiler, the same 15 for a heat pump. But then when I speak to professionals, they're suggesting that heat pumps are going to last last longer. Mm -hmm. For me, I think it's going to come down to the parts and the obsolescence. So if a manufacturer is supporting that gas boiler or that heat pump for a long period, it's going to last for long. The reason I'm having to replace Portland Square. Um, heating system is because the controls failed on the boiler and I've got no way to fire up those boilers. So it wasn't the fact that the boiler was physically broken, it was the control. So that could happen to a heat pump, I suppose, or it could happen to, could happen to a boiler. But I thought there's a law against that and not providing the um, parts over years and years and years. I think once you get to, so for example, for the Mary Newman boilers, 20 years, I think there's probably a, there's probably a point where that's not, not supported. Um, yeah. Certainly in the case that... That's not good enough. And then the elements, so particularly with air source heat pump, especially with the marine environment we are we're in, they are external units. So I think they are clearly going to be more prone to uh, to corrosion and to the elements. And like a gas boiler that'd be sat in a nice, cozy, warm plant room. Heat pumps cost more. Um, 
they do cost more to install. I think we, we discussed it, but to me and to the university, it's not all about the money. It obviously is about money, but it, it's about it's about the future. It's about reducing our carbon footprint. We've made commitments to net zero, um, and we're not going to achieve it if we don't do this. So it, it isn't really about it cost X amount. We need to get the most efficient and the best option that saves us revenue costs as well, which is, which is a good thing. But um, there are scary figures. Um, but Salix funding and some of the other options we discussed can take can take the edge off that. But generally, and in, in the in the projects that we've delivered, my team have delivered generally three to eight times more than if I just plonked in another gas boiler, because you're changing the emitters, because you're changing the pipe work. It's not just about the heat pump. It's about the the, the other bits and bobs around that. And the cheaper to run, what we've been seeing, 33% um, in a lot of cases, um, can be even, even greater than that. But that depends on electricity costs. And maintenance costs are similar, so I won't dwell on that. But, you know, we're not made, changing our forecast for maintenance. If we've got an air source heat pump or a um, source heat pump or a water source heat pump, we're making the same budget forecast as we were if it was a, if it was a gas system. Heat pumps only work on well insulated buildings. I think we discussed that. And there's absolute mileage in making the best out of insulating your roofs and insulating your, your walls and making sure that you've got best U values on your windows and, and all that good stuff. But it costs big money. Um, we are doing it at a time when we're intervening with the building because it's 50 years old and needs a, needs a new, new spring of life. But if we, again, went back to the old money and I've been kind of in energy management and in estates management for 20 years now, 10, 15 years ago, we used to say, well, we'll do that lighting, we'll do that energy saving project because it's a lighting project, we'll get a payback in three years. We can't treat heat pumps the same. The figures, you know, it isn't about that, it's about the carbon saving. So, you know, Scott Building, if we were to replace all its glazing, it cost us £857,000. And if you were thinking about it as a payback, you'd be talking £726,000. So, you know, it's, it's, it's big figures, it's big numbers. But the heat pumps do work in these buildings. We don't need to do that in this example for that, for that to work. And we've not found any of that a blocker um, on any of our buildings. Um, do they really reduce carbon? I don't think anyone needs convincing in this room. I hope that we've demonstrated that they absolutely do. We're seeing 66% reductions. Um, so that, that you know it's a it's an easy question to answer, and we've got figures um, figures to back that up. Um, I think it's easy to say we've got a heat pump now, and, and so it, it's solved, and we're saving loads of emissions. It's how you manage that controls and occupancy. You could have a heat pump and then just leave it on all the time, and it's not going to be as efficient. Um, you quite often see, if you start to look at buildings, you've got good metering, uh, that do I really need to run it at six o'clock at night when there's no one there? So, and are the controls working? Particularly two, three, five, ten years down the line, after you installed that system, are you still doing those checks and balances to make sure that you, you've not come out of, um, not come out of sync? This is just a snapshot of the kind of impact we've had on our heat. CO2, um, CO2 emissions. So for our total gas emissions is, is, in, is in green, about 2,000 uh, tons, of, tons of CO2. That's the chunk we've taken out. That's the chunk we've taken out today. Um, but we've got this coming. So we're at stage four with SDS for design of the library replacement at the moment. Big scary figure, 4.2 million. But that is the HVAC system is at an age it needs replacing or the emitters need replacing. So that is more than just a heat pump project. That is a Kind of whole ME services almost um, a, a replacement, um, but you know big big carbon savings again solar on the roof, um, and we've already done some fabric improvements on the roof and the glazing. Um, and then I talked about waste at the start. This is an opportunity district district network for the council. We're engaging with the council um, on this. Our next big opportunity is this kind of clump of buildings here, which is all supply from Davy. Forty two percent of our gas goes via that that our our on-site heat network. So we we defeat that, we sort we sort that out, we get rid of the gas there, then we've really taken the biggest chunk out of our out of our network and our carbon emissions. And that's kind of our next big step. And uh, it's gonna have to happen in the coming years because the CHP and the plant there is coming to the end of end of life. So I think in real summary, decision making, especially what Martin said, when you look at all those things, talking about design, there are so many decisions in all of that. What type of technology, what type of emitters, so, you know, and, you know, make sure you really consider your feasibility and what the best options are for you. Um, investment, you can't just treat it as a payback and return on investment. You've got to think bigger picture. Um, electricity, that's the bigger drive, biggest drive in some of these costs because you will have a capacity. You will have switchboards that need to be expanded or replaced. And we're at a point 
probably in the next project or two, well, we're going to have to engage in increasing our capacity um, to allow some of these heat pumps. Um, hybrid, you know, talk a lot um, now in professional forums. It would affect if you go for Salix funding, as an example, to try and get support for a heat pump. If you say you're using some gas in combination with that, I think you're automatically ruled out, so bear that in mind. But if you're trying to find that balance, then a lot of people, and there's a good example in the, in the city, so Ballard House, um, the city council have got heat pump there with a the gas to do the top up in the coldest, coldest days. Um, hybrid is an option. Um, and there is funding available, um, and it has helped us. On pretty, we've been successful with, I think, pretty much every project in getting some scale of some scale of funding, it does take the edge off. It does make it more achievable. Um, so yeah, even even for your own heat pump at home, obviously there's the there's a the home grant there. Mm -hmm. If anyone wants any more information, we have a sustainability website. You can use the QR code. That's it from me. Thank you very much for listening. Mm -hmm. Thank you. much all of you. I think you all explained that really calmly, concisely, clearly. Like I said, I, I'm not techy enough to understand the detail, but I think I even got my head around it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All of you did too. Are there any other questions? I've got two, two one, one's round and one's air. Um, the round one is, how big is the, the drilling rig and could you actually get it into say Victorian courtyard garden? Yep, yeah, um, so the drilling rig I had in my house got through the garden gate. You could take it apart, take it through the house if somebody was willing to clear up afterwards. Um, so you can be quite small. Some of the drilling companies now are looking at drilling down to about 100 metres off the side of a JCB, like an attachment. Um, the ones we used at Marjan, would they, fit, they would not fit through the garden. No. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it depends on how deep you have to drill. So the ones at Marjan down to about 240 metres. Camacho 404, and so it's kind of the size of a, a Land Rover with a trailer, uh, and that's kind of you know. And then they have an arm that goes on, they have three meter uh, drilling rods that then go down into the ground. Uh, and my essence one was if you had a really drafty garage, could you actually put the pump in the garage, or does it have to be outside? Is there no service that's where you can move it indoors? So the answer is they prefer to be outdoors, yeah. um, but you can get units that you can duct for example so that, that is not our true. portland square air source heat pump is internal in the plant room but is ducted to external right so, so you could maybe take it out through the garage yeah. roof and just have it standing inside and yeah okay that's it's better outside but we have yeah, yeah. I, I, I live on the house so i'm representing a lot of people who have listed properties etc and there's huge problems with putting them outdoors small courtyards that are noisy etc so the idea of putting them in an outhouse or a garage or something like that with all the plumbing and of course, then, as we said, reduces because they're very close to the ocean and the, and the salt. It also yeah. helps to reduce the, the, the ground source on the home, actually, on the thin limestone. Yeah, <laughs> let's get the drilling rigs in there. I didn't realize they were so small. They can be. I mean, uh, so we've done a village in Stidians in Cornwall where we put yeah, boreholes right in the street. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you have to get a lot of uh, buy in from uh, the local council. But Plymouth City Council is, is particularly good at this. So. Um, you know, it may be worth speaking to the low carbon officers and see if you can get that set. Right. Perhaps next to the water pipes while they're doing it because you've dug in the streets up to repair it every other day. Oh, <laughs> well, that would be coordinated <laughs> thinking. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you. I think there's one of hand Yeah. Um, obviously, we've got some exemplary providers here, um, but I'm just interested in a, um, an, in, uh, an industry perspective on how many cowboys are out there best avoided. <laughs> um, without naming any names or anything. Oh, I, wouldn't uh, names. <laughs> I think on heat pumps, <laughs> I've not experienced a cowboy yet. So, uh, but you know, we support the water source, for as an example, we couldn't even get a cowboy to come and do it. <laughs> to, 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 to come and do it. But you know, luckily, luckily, Tarp, Tarp stepped up. So, um, I've not okay. experienced that. Is think, there much competition? I think probably in the air source and maybe the ground, maybe there is. Um, there wasn't for the water. Is the technology English or German? Um, oh gosh, the first heat pump, 1830, probably American. I think they were invented to create ice for cocktails. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the ammonia, and there was an ammonia heat pump in Worcester, which was made to in, uh, create ice. Uh, so the ammonia heat pumps, you know, talk about uh, low temperatures, they actually go up to 90 degrees. 
Um, so, you know, it, the technology has been around for a very, very long time. I just noticed Schneider in it. Um, well, oh, Kenza, is, MSX, Kenza is a Cornish word for first, or first born. So, uh, yeah, you know, they're looking, everyone's good. Um, it's just on uh, cowboys. The heat pot manufacturers are all pretty well regulated, and I wouldn't say there's a, a, a cowboy amongst them. Um, however, the installers, it's really important to get an MCS accredited. Uh, I think you would probably agree that an MCS accreditation is really important. And if you use Kenza or, or Valent or somebody that's, they can offer an umbrella. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if, are you MCS? No. What does it stand for, MCS? Micro Generation Certification Scheme. So that's the really important thing to look for within the uh, heat pump industry. Um, so if you're getting one installed, yeah, make sure they've got that or the manufacturer can provide that uh, accreditation. It, it, it's basically a checks and balances. But the actual installers, Installing the, uh, the heat pump itself is not particularly um, beyond gas engineers. It's the design of the system and getting that bit right. Mm -hmm. I think in response to your question with regards to cowboys, obviously the domestic market is always the hot spot for that. I would say more so than, than anything commercial. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there's so many plumbers around, and, 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 and many of them may tell you that they could install a heat pump, whether it's actually being done correctly. Is um, another thing. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, I was reading in the paper today that by 2050 we'll be routinely getting temperatures of 40 plus <laughs> for days on end in the summertime. So is there, a, is there a case for making sure that all systems installed now are reversible just to, um, to make them future proof yeah, for, cooling. for cooling needs? We, we, um, yes, you can. It's, as, as you can know, it's possible, but it should yeah. they all be routinely made? Well, heat pumps can provide cooling through two different ways. So through yeah. active cooling, kind of mm. reversing the system, yeah. but that's using the electricity to create mm. the cool. So if you need a lot of cooling, that's mm. what you would do. Mm. We've developed a system called passive cooling, uh, which is very good for housing. So on those days where you've got you know, uh, 36, 37 degrees, as we did a year or two ago, you can use the cook from the ground. So you're getting 12 degrees mm -hmm. in through your ground or and instead of it going through the heat pump, just bypass the heat pump with a little circulator pump, put it through a fan core unit, and that can blow air into one room, or if you've got MVHR systems, so we're designing now with lots of flats in mind, where uh, you're blowing that 12 degrees through the MVHR. And it doesn't completely solve a problem, mm -hmm. it just adds to a, TM59 calculation. Are the, are the S source systems intrinsically reversible anyway off the shelf, or do they have to be designed specially to be reversible? I would say that they all have the capability, but it's right. whether as standard that's enabled by yeah. the manufacturer. So right. it is, if it's something you're looking into, mm -hmm. just make sure that that manufacturer has but that. When yeah. we do a project, we do that. Is TM59 the right thing? Uh, so, yeah, we do a TM59 is for residential overheating. so. On that slide, I said TM52 because it was a commercial property, mm -hmm. but yeah. So we would look forward the five, ten years, we'd use a, a heated model that would look forward for those years. Right. And yeah. as part of that, we'd decide, well, actually, yeah, the building's not going to perform that very well because it's old, hasn't got free or whatever. Mm -hmm. So we might need to make some allowance for, for cool. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, someone's got a question. Um, there's someone? a few more online. Yeah. Um, okay. So, um, Going back to the, the, uh, the ground floor heat pump, um, does every house or flat have to have its own borehole and pump, or can they have a district heat pump system? Uh, so we're designing systems now with housing uh, where instead of putting in the gas network, you would put in a borehole and pipe network, so that all goes in the street uh, where the gas pipes used to be, and the developer, when they're building a the house, instead of building it with a gas boiler box, they'll put a heat pump box in, um, and standard cylinder and radiators. Yeah. So, no, you don't have to have your own borehole. Much like the village at Marsden. That's right. Which is yeah. a yeah. exactly yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 individual. Yeah. Terraced houses, <coughs> but same principle. Yes. Another one. Um, so, this is from uh, John Salmon. It says, in the UK, we have the cheapest gas and most expensive electricity anywhere in Europe. There's taxes only on electricity. The government has suggested that this will be rebalanced over time, favouring heat pumps. Do you agree with this? That this will help the rollout along with greater grant incentives? You have to take that one. <laughs> 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 
I think it will. I think it will help. Yeah. I think it will be, 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 great, be great for that to, to happen. But yeah, yeah. It's, it's certainly help because you know, some of the costs that we were looking at there, yeah. um, the, the yields, the, the payback, your, your revenue spent on running a building will be significantly less. Mm. Um, well, certainly, think, a lot of people who are considering it would probably go yeah. for it. Yeah. I'd, I'd only add to that that it's. You know, we talked about fuel poverty, so we've got to consider that there's a lot of houses with gas boilers in and they've sort of got a low um, cost for gas at the moment. But if mm. you increase that significantly, that could put a lot of people yeah. in a really hard <coughs> position. So I think that's probably the, the issue at the moment. Mm. If you only have to go back two years from February when the Ukraine situation happened and what happened with the gas prices at that point. And I think commercially, because we've, we've been discussing mainly commercial installations, as Brad said, it, it wasn't a cost decision. It was purely about the CO2 um, and decarbonisation. I think residentially, obviously, you're going to be looking for that payback on a certain term. I think this is, I, I would say, John, that um, perhaps you could um, not put price of gas up, but bring the price of clean electricity down. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the cost of kilowatt hour per um, that's made by a wind tunnel, a turbine, especially an onshore wind turbine, is cheaper than any other way of making electricity. So, it's finding some way of uh, letting everybody have that cost of electricity rather than paying it for the expensive, dirty stuff. Mm -hmm. Any more questions online? Um, one last one um, from Paula down at is um, I'm a landscape architect. What impact do ground source heat pumps have on the ground temperature and will standard landscaping plants succeed? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so what we explained earlier on about smart and internet things, technology and what we're doing with the monitoring. And as part of the next phase of monitoring, we are looking at putting smart probes in the ground in various places to see that effect on the ground and therefore what it will do to growing conditions, etc. going forward. And just want to add, so when we design everything to an MCS standard, it's designed so the boreholes don't go below a certain temperature and everything's buried um, at least 650 millimetres below the ground. The majority of it is a metre or below. Um, so it doesn't really have an effect on anything growing on the surface. Um, we've got 25 years of experience and a majority of that time, certainly the first 10, 15 years of Kenza's life, most of it was um, installations in countryside type houses, farms, cottages, uh, with horizontal um, <coughs> uh, uh, pipes, and you know, we didn't really see any effect. I've got one last one. Um, again, talking about water source heat pumps, could we do um, more with the sea as a heat source in Plymouth? Uh, yes. Yeah, I think the, the, the Brixham case study, which was a, mm. which was a, was which was an open loop, proved particularly on cold days that it could definitely uh, be be efficient. Um, but the significant Cost in that we've not done a feasibility study yet on some other marine station, for example, which we've got an asset very close to the close to the water's edge, and it's I don't know, five years old or something that it is now. Um, I think there's other priorities for us because we've got bigger carbon elsewhere. But I think at the time where that asset is coming to a time of replacement, will be something that is part of the feasibility mm -hmm. study to, to to consider. Yeah, I think it's it's a, a balance really because. It looks great on paper, lets you use seawater, but the environmental aspects, that's the balance point. So if you have people who are on board and want to work with you and make it make it happen, then then that's great. But typically it's the impact of having to put a system in the sea and how that impacts the environment in the sea. Perhaps <clears throat> Tangle Lots in Southern Harbour could use Southern Harbour water and the council could insist on it as part of the bill cost. <laughs> it's really interesting in Plymouth because the NBA already sucks the seawater in, doesn't it? So we did look at a system of putting some closely piped in their pools to extract the water. One of the problems with seawater systems, there's quite a few, but generally you're taking the saline solution out of the sea, passing it through a land-based heat exchanger, and that then has implications 
firstly your pump, uh, your your inlet that gets clogged up, and so you have to turn divers down and keep on blocking it. Um, and then you know putting anything through a land-based heat exchanger, you're going to constant maintenance to probably replacement up to ten years. Um, you know it can work at certain scales. Um, we've looked at it and we haven't implemented anything yet. But, mm. Environmental reservoir is too far away to serve Plymouth. Good luck, Ollie. It's just the distance. It's yeah. he's got to be close enough. It, it, it's all the, with that kind of thing. It's all about then financial viability, uh, and it's, we generally start off thinking, can we drill down 150 meters? How much does that cost? And then looking around with a closed loop system, so it's very uh, you know, no impact on the environment. Um, and then you have a look around, what else is available? Can we use the water? Can we use the sea? Is that going to be any better? Is it better efficiencies? Can be cheaper to run? And is it going to provide better efficiencies, which ultimately is that then less CO2? So we kind of go through that design process. Okay. I think that's the end of questions. I just wanted, while we're all here, to give James from Planet Devices an opportunity to just stand up and tell us about his project, because he's been doing some innovative stuff that links in with what you're doing. So I'd like to start with a show of hands. Who came in here today with a preconception about heat pumps? Were they too expensive? Uh, are they noisy? Anybody? <laughs> okay, I'm glad for what? Part of the reason we're all here today is because there is that misconception and myths in the media about how it all works. And if we want to decarbonize, we have to use heat pumps or something similar. So we've got to get the ball rolling here. So um, a colleague, George, 11 months ago, we threw around this idea with experience of heat pump installers and people in the industry saying, we just don't have the tooling. Um, we're struggling with, to sell homeowners on this. You know, And we were thinking, how can we help with that? So we've turned around this little device in the last 11 months, and we're giving this to installers, distributors, people in the industry. And what this does is it takes data directly from the heat pump, tell you how much it's costing you to run, how well is it working? Because at the moment, it's a bit based on faith. You go to installer A, they say, oh, pay me this much and it'll work. Go to installer B and you keep going down that, that line. But you agree with it has to be based on a bit of data and science, of course, to know what you're actually getting out of it. If you're going for the government grant, you've got seven and a half thousand pounds to play with, but then even then, the average cost of a heat pump, if you go via the MCS, 13,000 pounds. So there's still five and a half thousand pounds there that you're paying. You think, oh, I could have bought a boiler, I could have just kept on going, right? So, you know, with this little device here, compatible with up to 90% of the heat pump sold on the market. So your installer can specify something that's right for you, and it doesn't matter which manufacturer it is. Frankly speaking, we shouldn't care. It should just be the right thing for you. So I've got, I don't want to miss my talking points here. So I've got my little piece of paper to help me. So you can expect, if you go for a retrofit solution as yourself, as a homeowner, up to £1,000, around £600 to monitor how well this is working for you. But we're offering this for £200 or less to promote the adoption, to help you on that journey. And we've already got hundreds of people just in the UK and Ireland looking at this to start implementing it. Not only does it help them reduce their costs and make sure that you get repairs faster, but um, it means that it increases that adoption rate and it gives you that, that reference. So installer A gives you no advantage, gives you no, I'll guarantee you this. Whereas installer B can say, yeah, I've fitted to 10 already. Here's how well they're working. Which one to fit one for you? Of course, you're going to go for that. Um, and I should also say that our core team of four Plymouth graduates um, working hard the last seven months, we're finding out next week if we run a, run a grant mm -hmm. to expand this into solar, EV, battery storage, which will optimise for your entire home. So that's it from me. Appreciate you've had two hours listening to people. So I won't take up any more of your time. Hopefully see you on the tour seeing heat pumps because heat pumps are very interesting. But I'll stop there. If any of this has been remotely interesting, come and speak to me or George, look at plant devices. Thank you very much. You've all sat there really patiently. I told Andy you didn't need a refreshment break halfway through because if we gave you that, we'd never get you back again. So, yeah. thank you very much for listening.
amazing panel of speakers because you're uh, well you're the the gurus so we need to listen and learn and build on your experience to try and roll this out faster and in mass across the city and um, there is a little opportunity with brad if, if any of you would like to stay and have a look around that's yesterday yeah yeah and that's yesterday building um 